Well, it's my privilege to share with you a story from from God's Word today. And I want to say thank you to to Pastor Blake for giving me the opportunity to share with you. We're going to discover together from this story some things that God is calling us to obey today. So if you'll take out your Bible and find John chapter 4. Now, if you don't, if you don't have a Bible, uh, you don't know how to find John chapter 4, it's okay. No worries, because all of the scripture will be up on the screen. Or if you want to use a Bible, you want to use the Pew Bible, look for page 1651. That's where John chapter 4 begins in the Pew Bible. So you can grab that, use that. Now, you're going to need some other stuff. You're going to need something to write on. So I hope you picked up this handout on the way in. Or I hope you have a notebook, or maybe you want to use the notes app on your phone, whatever works for you. You're also going to need a pen or a pencil, or your thumbs if you're using your phone. Don't write with a pencil on your phone. Uh, and then you're going to need a couple of other things. You're going to need an open attitude, expecting God to speak to you through his word. And then you're going to need to, to set an intention to obey whatever he calls you to do. So those things, all right? You got everything you need? Okay, let's get started. So we're going to explore a true story from the Bible that's told by John. Now, John was a follower of Jesus, and he was one of Jesus' closest friends. Uh, John is an eyewitness to some of, the, some of the story that he's telling, and he had intimate access to all the other major characters of this story. So we can trust his version of this story. Well, before we, before we delve into the story, we need, to, we need to set the scene. So this is in John chapter 4. In John chapter 3, Jesus and his disciples had been in and around Jerusalem. This is a part of the Bible where Jesus has this famous life-changing conversation with a man named Nicodemus. You may know this, uh, you may know this story. This is the story where Jesus drops the famous line, John 3.16. Do you know it? For God so loved the world? That one. Okay, so this is that story. That happens in John chapter 3. Uh, Jesus goes on in that same conversation to say this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So he said that in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he's going to take action on that and show us exactly what he was talking about with that mission. So Jesus and his disciples are headed back home to Galilee, and they have to make a pit stop in Samaritan country, and that's where things get interesting. So listen to this true story from the Bible as recorded in John chapter 4, starting in verse 3. So he, Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. So there are some crucial details here about the setting of this story. Jesus was tired from his long journey. It was a hot day. He sits down by a well in a town called Sychar. Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Now, before we go any further, you have to understand the background. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. There was this centuries-old feud going on between the Jews and the Samaritans, with each side claiming that the other side was wrong about how to worship God and where to worship God. So Jesus striking up a conversation with this Samaritan woman was a big deal. Also, let's take note of what the disciples are doing in this, in this scene. Just side note. So the disciples... As soon as they arrived at the well, the disciples exited the scene to go to lunch. And I think that maybe this, you know, this agenda of the disciples is kind of representative of uh, of my attitude, maybe your attitude, what a lot of church folks uh, might be doing in this situation. So Jesus has this life-changing mission. He wants to rescue people who are far from God. Uh, Instead of being 
where Jesus is, being beside him, doing the work that, that he's doing, we've exited the scene to head to Chick-fil-A with the disciples. So that may, uh, that's maybe just me, but that's what I think uh, that, that we might be doing in this scene. We might be with those guys instead of with Jesus doing the work that he's come to do. So let me tell you about this lady at the well. The, the woman at the well is what modern day missionaries might call a person of peace. So a person of peace is open to receiving the messenger, that's Jesus in this case, receiving the message of Jesus and receiving the mission. So that's the kind of person that Jesus is looking for, a person of peace. And this lady was the person of peace who brought her whole village to Jesus. But before that could happen, Jesus had to overcome some obstacles that this lady brought to the well with her that day. There were obstacles that kept her far away from God and his people. And there's some of the same obstacles that keep us today from hearing from Jesus and obeying what he's calling us to do. So let's look at the following verses, one obstacle at a time. Let's, let's break down the obstacles, let's identify them, and let's ask ourselves if each obstacle is something that we need to deal with. Or is it something that is not an obstacle in our own life, but we need to, to deal with it uh, as a church because it may be preventing people who are far away from God from coming to him? Um, by the way, this may sting a little bit talking about some of these obstacles. I know it does for me. Fair warning. Let's move on. Obstacle number one. We've actually already seen it. It's in verses seven and eight. Look at this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Obstacle number one is physical needs and day-to-day -day concerns. You know, any kind of physical need can be an obstacle to people who are far from God. And we're called to meet physical needs just like Jesus did. Jesus healed sick people and he fed hungry people so that they could give their attention to his message about the kingdom of God. And we do this. We're doing a good job with this. Right now, today, we have a team in Guatemala doing this very thing, right? They're providing medical care. They're providing food because these kind of physical needs are obstacles that prevent people from hearing and responding to the good news of salvation through Jesus. And we engage in this same kind of ministry right here on our local mission field. We meet physical needs because physical needs can be an obstacle that keep people far away from God. So that's obstacle number one, physical needs, day-to-day -day concerns. Let's look at obstacle number two in verse nine. Look at this verse. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Obstacle number two is prejudice and cultural divisions. This woman brings up the, the old Jew-Samaritan controversy and, and their history of animosity with each other as cultural groups. And, you know, let's be honest, we have the same kind of divisions in our world today, right? Race and culture and politics and gender, economics. And as much of these things are, are divisions in our world, they were also uh, divisions in Jesus' time as well. And these divisions create obstacles that Jesus can break through. At the heart of all these issues, these divisive issues, is a person's identity and a person's sense of belonging. Think about this. Our human nature says this. I have a label. It's part of my identity. I see myself uh, as, as a certain kind of person, and that's my identity. And you have a label. You're in this group. And I can't be welcome into this group unless I'm willing to change my identity to match the identity of this group. That's how these divisions start. 
That's our human nature. But the Holy Spirit can transcend all of this, can overcome our human nature. There's a, there's a great quote by a, a former Franciscan priest named Brennan Manning. And he says this, God loves me as I am, not as I should be. I think about that a lot. Let me say it again. God loves me as I am, not as I should be. And I think the Holy Spirit can help each of us say to all kinds of different people, God loves you just as you are, not the way I think you should be. Are we open to having the Holy Spirit change our attitude so that we are saying, I love you exactly as you are, not as I think you should be? I think God can help us do that. Look at obstacle number three in verses 10, 11, and 12. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Obstacle number three includes traditions and background and a rigid mindset. See, this lady is holding on to her traditions. She's, she's stuck in her old beliefs. And, and we can be the same way, can't we? If we're honest, clinging to our own ideas, unwilling to let go and embrace something new. Well, Jesus invites us to hold on to our traditions loosely, to be open to change, for the sake of love and connection. You know, traditions and symbols that are meaningful to one person or group might be painful reminders to another person or group of hurt that they experienced in the past. You know, so many people have been hurt by the church and by church people. And some of our favorite traditions and symbols represent that hurt for those people. And you know, it's just not loving to ask a person to, to just get over it about the symbols of their hurt. So we make sacrifices of our tradition, and we do it willingly out of love for people who are far away from God. Or sometimes our traditions just become meaningless symbols and we've forgotten what they mean. That's a little bit of what's going on in this story. See, on a hot day, the most important thing about the well was that it had a cool drink of water, not that Jacob dug the well, you know? So sometimes our traditions, they're, they're the container for the gift of God's grace to us. But if the container becomes more important than the gift of grace that it contains, or worse still, if the container itself prevents people from experiencing the gift of grace that it contains, then that container, that tradition, has ceased to serve the purpose for which it was created. So we have to ask ourselves, do we care more about our traditions and symbols than we care about loving people and inviting them into God's plan for redemption? Are we willing to make sacrifices for the sake of others? Obstacle number four in verse 13, 14, and 15. Look at the next few verses. Jesus is saying this, ma'am, you're thinking about this specific well and its specific history, but I'm talking about something deeper. I'm talking about your soul and your spirit. Look at the verses, verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and, and have to keep coming here to draw water. 
shame. Obstacle number four is shame. And now Jesus is, is getting to the real raw spot that's preventing this lady from coming to God. You see, she's an outcast. She's drawing water alone in the heat of the day. She's been ostracized by her community. She's been shunned by the socially acceptable folks of Sychar who come to draw their water early in the morning when the day is cool. And every time she's there alone drawing that water, she feels the sting of shame. You know, they say guilt is the feeling that you have when you've done something bad. But shame says to you, I am bad. Shame goes to the core of who you are and says, I am bad. And this, this woman carries shame with her. She is filled with shame. But Jesus offers her living water that washes away her shame. He invites her into a community where she belongs, where she's loved unconditionally. Well, do we reinforce shame in people or do we offer them an antidote to their shame? You see, the opposite of shame is belonging. Shame says you aren't worthy to belong here. But the authentic love of Jesus and his people says, welcome. You have finally found the place where you belong. Come on in and be a part of us. Obstacle number five in verse 16. This lady's asking Jesus for relief, for shame, and, and Jesus gives her some specific instructions in verse 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. So obstacle number five is disconnected relationships and a, a lack of trust. See, this lady longs for human connection. Five different times she's tried to attach herself to a husband and his household. She's looking for love and provision and protection. And five different times she was rejected. She was cast out to live alone and make her way on her own. Now she's in this transactional relationship with some guy and she has no guarantee of love or security. But Jesus offers her something different, a relationship built on genuine connection and unconditional love. Are we inviting people into a relational connection? Are we giving people a place where they can be known and accepted? Let's make it even more simple. Are we helping people make friends? That's what we all really look for, right? We just want someone to be our friend. Obstacle number six, look in verse 19. Jesus' last comment about her, about her husband's and her relationship history hit a little bit close to home. So this lady diverted to the age-old debate between the Jews and the Samaritans about where to worship. Look at the scripture. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Well, she's revealing obstacle number six, legalistic religion, non-essential conflict, judgmental attitudes. She's stuck on the external details of religion. She's missing the point of true worship. And let's be honest, we can get caught up in these same debates, can't we? Arguing about the minor stuff while missing the heart of Jesus' message. We major on the minors. So are we willing to offer people freedom in the non-essential parts of spiritual life? 
together for the sake of overcoming obstacles that keep people far away from God? Let's look at the last obstacle. Obstacle number seven, verse 21. In reply to the woman's argument about all these external details, Jesus makes a huge statement about the reality of a relationship with God. You see, God isn't concerned about the external details. God looks at the heart and he's looking for people who will allow themselves to be energized by his spirit for the purpose of obeying the truth of his word. Look beginning in verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I think obstacle number seven is uh, valid questions and a lack of understanding and limiting beliefs. The woman was seeking answers. Jesus had made a really complicated, deep statement about the nature of God and, and his worshipers. And the woman was seeking answers. She didn't really understand. And it's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts and insecurities, uncertainty. People come to Jesus all the time, and people come to our church all the time with serious questions, legitimate questions about the nature of God. Can God be trusted? Is the Bible believable? So sitting in the tension of these hard questions is the first step to finding the answers that you seek. Let me say that again, just in case you have questions this morning. Sitting in the tension of these hard questions is the first step to finding the answers that you seek. So are we willing to do this with people? To allow space for questions, to allow people to be honest about their doubts and uncertainties, and to walk with someone on a journey from unbelief to belief? These are things that Jesus is calling us to do. So those are the seven obstacles that you can see in this passage. But here's the amazing part. Jesus overcomes all the obstacles to make himself known to this lady. Every single obstacle, one at a time, is overcome one by one for the purpose of making Jesus' identity known to this woman. Look at verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is revealing himself to be the Messiah the promised rescuer that both the Jews and the Samaritans have been waiting for for generations. And by the way, this is the first time in John's biography of Jesus that Jesus clearly identifies himself as the Messiah. And knowing Jesus' identity transforms the woman's identity. At the end of her conversation with Jesus, her identity is completely transformed. She experiences the living water that Jesus told her about. She finds an overflowing source of compassion and boldness to go and share with the villagers of Sychar who considered her an outcast. It's important to note a couple of things about the new identity that Jesus gave this lady. It was for the purpose of reaching her community with the gospel, of rescuing her whole community from being far away from God. She wasn't just transformed so that husband number six might be a slightly better class of loser than husband one, two, three, four, five. And she wasn't just made more respectable so that maybe now she could get herself elected as the, the vice president of the Sychar Ladies Garden Club or something like that. 
No, she was transformed so that she could get connected to the mission of Jesus and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in her community and call people to repent and believe in Jesus. Look at how this woman takes on the mission of Jesus. Look in verse 28. It says this, Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and they made their way toward him. So the woman from the well, this person of peace, is the person that God uses to share the good news of salvation with her whole village. Now, skip down a few verses in your Bible. Look at verse 39 and see how the mission of Jesus is multiplied. Listen to this. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So the mission of Jesus is multiplied. The woman and later all the other villagers become partners with Jesus in overcoming obstacles. And today, Jesus is overcoming our obstacles and wants to make us partners in his mission as well. You know, Jesus never interacts with us, neither through the Bible, nor through his Holy Spirit, nor through a conversation with another believer, without calling us to take a simple next step to follow him. And, you know, we call these next steps, and and you've got a next steps card in the pew in front of you. So I believe that after hearing this story, Jesus is inviting us individually and as his church, to take some next steps. So you can use this card from your seat back. Just go ahead and grab it and use it to communicate your next step. You can let us know that that you are our guest today. You can let us know that you want to follow Jesus, that you want to make uh, this church your new home. You can let us know that you want to join a group or, or be baptized or volunteer or just get somebody to answer your questions. Use this form to communicate that. Or if you're with us online, or if you'd just rather use the online form, you can find that at fbcls.info slash next. So you can use all of these ways to let us know about your next step. But what if none of these boxes really fit your next step today? What if you, you made all those decisions, you checked all those boxes years ago? Well, God is still calling each of us to take a next step. You can write it in the comments box on that card and turn it in, or you can just make a firm decision in your mind and your heart and take action on that as you move into the next week. Will you bow your head with me? Let's think about our next step. And you respond as as the Holy Spirit leads you. I want to ask us some questions that I think God is asking us today. And I think that the Holy Spirit will use your answers to these questions to help discern the next step that God has prepared for you. So as we're bowing our heads, ask yourself this question. Do you have empathy for the obstacles of others? Can you put yourself in their shoes? Can you see the barriers that they're up against? Offer understanding and compassion to them? Next question. Are you partnering with Jesus to overcome obstacles to belief and connection in people who are far from God? What's your perspective? Are you on the lookout for a person of peace? Are you praying for a person that God has placed in your life, someone that you live with or work with or or play with so that you can partner with Jesus in overcoming the obstacles in that person's life? Are you prepared to share your story of salvation, prepared to share the good news 
that Jesus overcomes obstacles and rescues us from the penalty of sin and transforms our identity completely? Final question. Do you need to allow Jesus to overcome some obstacles in your life? Today, you may feel like the woman at the very beginning of this story, outcast, filled with shame, disconnected from relationships, filled with questions, searching for love and belonging, hurt by judgmental church folks in the past. We all carry burdens and struggles, but Jesus offers us a new identity, a fresh start. We can leave behind shame and disconnected relationships and limiting beliefs. We can embrace our true identity as followers of Jesus and join him in a mission to transform lives. You know, a transformed life is not so much a change in status. It's seeing yourself for the first time the way God sees you. And Jesus is ready to make this transformation happen for you today. You just make a spiritual change of direction. Just turn around from heading towards yourself, your agenda, your desires, your identity. Turn around and head towards Jesus, his love for you, his kindness, the unbelievably good plan that he has for your life. You do this by admitting to God and yourself that you're headed in the wrong direction. We, we call that sin. And by believing that Jesus is the one and only person who can make it possible for you to please God and believing that Jesus died and was resurrected so that he could give you a new life and then making today a declaration that you have a new identity as a follower of Jesus and that Jesus has all authority in your life. You can do this by saying a simple prayer, just a conversational prayer, talking to God exactly the way you would talk to a person who you trust, that you can be honest with, a person who cares for you deeply. Just pray a simple prayer and tell Jesus what you need. Express to him your need to change directions and have a new identity and give him all authority. And then let us know. Use the card, use the online form, or members of our team will be here at the front as we sing this next song. Come and share with us your next step. We'd be glad to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. So let's pray together and let's give this time to Jesus as he works in our heart and lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you this time. We know you are at work right now in this place, overcoming obstacles that keep us far away from God. We give this to you. We want you to do whatever you want to do in our lives as we follow you. So right now, Lord Jesus, we're praying in your name and for your sake, for your glory. And we pray together. Amen. You come.